Breaker Breaker Crunchers, welcome to a very special episode of Couch Crunchers where we are still trying to figure out if Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0 is more or less than Evangelion 2.0. Today I am joined by a man of many talents, including voice actor, dating relationship guru, and real estate investor. Our listeners will probably know him best as the voice of Shinji Ikari from Neon Genesis Evangelion and his numerous movie retcons, retellings, reimaginings, however you want to put it, Mr. Spike Spencer. Yeah. Yeah. Yay! Spencer. Welcome Hello. To the show. <laughs> Welcome uh, to glad the show. to be here, my friend. So what are we what are we talking about today? Well, we're just gonna we're gonna kind of get to know you and and talk about some of the stuff that uh, your 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 projects that you've got ongoing. Um, but right off the bat, uh, Couch Crunchers always starts by asking, "What is it that you're watching, you're reading, you're listening to that you think our listeners would be interested in?" Ooh, gosh. Uh, so my my nerd out okay my geek nerd world geek out is sci-fi so uh i'm all up on uh star trek discovery right now and uh so that's that's what i've been watching a lot of and uh oddly enough we've been watching ancient aliens on uh, netflix the special and going through is like that's interesting <laughs> the history so. channel that wants to credit all of our uh, all of humanity's greatest triumphs to aliens right? Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really cool. You know, I'm, I always told myself, like, I'm like Fox Mulder. I want to believe, you know. <laughs> so let me, uh, as soon as the aliens come down and, you know, they can forego the anal probe, but, uh, you know, sure, hey, whatever, you know, it's, uh, let's talk. Hey, I mean, how, how do you know if you really hate it unless you try it first, right? Hey, buy me a drink first. <laughs> <No talk. laughs> All right, then, okay. So. Oh, man, that that's pretty good. It has been a pretty crazy year for sure. Have you picked up any new skills or hobbies in 2020? Well, interesting enough, uh, I have a very odd uh, situation here. You mind if I go into that real quick? Yeah, uh, well, let's do it. I'm in Australia. So um, I was appearing at a convention here in Melbourne and Australia. And as soon as we pulled in, we went to Melbourne and then, uh, sorry, Melbourne and the Gold Coast in Australia. Uh, we went to Melbourne, did that. COVID was starting to be a thing. Everybody's like, what's going on? And then uh, we pulled into the Gold Coast the day Tom Hanks said he had COVID, which he was blocks away from us at that moment. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So the whole world went, if Tom Hanks has it, oh, my Lord, you know, um, <laughs> America's sweetheart. So it's like, well, now what? You know, um, so we uh, were there for two weeks while everything was closing down and getting weird. And we decided to stay. Um, we were like ready on the last flight, one of the last flights that was going out. They were, Qantas was starting to shut down. And so we're like, you know what? We're going to stay. We're going to ride it out here. I figured it was going to be a couple of weeks, a couple of months, it'd be no big deal. Well, uh, that did not happen. So nine months later, uh, we packed for three weeks and we've been here for nine months. And it looks like we're going to stay for probably a couple of years now, uh, which is fine. Australia is awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. I love Australia. Uh, but in answer to your question to get, a, get the long story to get to that is that whilst here, I started my membership group, the reluctant heroes journey, uh, for it's kind of for the geek nerd world, uh, a personal growth and self-development. Um, I started my mind scrambler podcast in earnest. I had started it before, but I really didn't know if it was even up until I got here. Then I'm like, Oh yeah, iTunes has it up. Yay. I should do more. So I'm doing more. <laughs> As a matter of fact, my interview with Wendy Lee just came out uh, yesterday, which uh, was amazing. And I've just got a new uh, person who's going to be on who just said they'd be on. And was like, I'm dying. Oh, I can't say anything yet. Uh, so I started the podcast that I started my uh, my coaching, the, the relationship coaching. I am not a guru, my friend, by the way. I'm a coach, which is a different thing. Gurus are, I don't know. Um, but it's like I am a relationship communication and connection coach. And so I built, started building up that as well and um and still doing voiceover uh long range because you got internet they're doing the same thing in burbank you could be two doors away but you still have to do it over the internet so what's the difference burbank australia hey it's all good so those are the things and i'm, I'm working on another uh another book and uh just i guess the newest thing is walking on the beach every day <laughs> glorious the glorious it's, beaches it's terrible. of Australia. It's terrible. 
Well, that's wonderful. Um, so let's talk about some of your voiceover work. Um, you did a couple of characters for the League of Legends video game. Is that right? Yep. Uh, Wukong, the Monkey King, and Colonel Kled. Colonel Kled. If you had to choose one of them as your teammate for a dodgeball match, which one would you choose? Oh, Kled, man. Kled. He would eat the dodgeballs. I mean, just <laughs> get it. And then oh. eat the opponents. So, you know, it's like, fine. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah I, I have I, one of my new hobbies and skills was I set up a dodgeball league for me and a few of my friends. There's not a ton of us, but just a few of my friends. COVID yeah. safe. Um, and always looking for new talent. Um, so yeah, I would, I, I'm with you. I think I'd pick Colonel Khaled for this one. Yeah, why not? All right. So Is I it with to... or without Scarl? That's the question. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I think uh, just to keep things even, we'll probably just take Colonel Khaled. Okay. Although Wukong's got some moves. So tough call. Yeah, you know, he, he does kind of embody the five Ds, you know. He's got the, the dodge and the duck and the dive and the dip and the dodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. But can he throw? Can't I thought it was catch. dodge, duck, dip, dive. Dang! That burns. <laughs> that stings. Oh, All right, so I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the Evangelion movies. Mm -hmm. Are their titles supposed to be as mathematically perplexing as... I have no idea. Oh, my gosh. That's, here's the thing. If you're asking for in-depth Evangelion knowledge, you're barking up the wrong voice actor because <laughs> I got no clue, man. <laughs> well, uh, that's good. That's good to know. It's good to know that you, who are, are basically the star of the show, are as perplexed as the rest of us. Uh, well, here's the thing. You know, it's I'm not the star of the show because obviously you've seen how easy I can be replaced uh, with Netflix. So it's like... It's, it's a role that I've done for 25 years, for sure. And I've already stated on Twitter, I said, look, if I am asked to get back in that freaking robot, I will do so one last time. Uh, I may not get asked. And if I do get asked, I can't say anything until it comes out unless they want to announce it or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at this moment in time, I know nothing. I literally know nothing. It's not like, oh, yeah, I know nothing. It's like, I seriously know nothing. Um, so that, if that gives you any, any <laughs> idea of where I'm coming from. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, tell me about your experience working for that show. I mean, it's been, it's been a number of years, but um, Man. what are the memorable moments? Well, so many of them because, see, a lot of people don't understand. Um, and, uh, oh, by the way, one of the reasons why I'm here is in Australia is because uh, Amanda Wynn Lee and Tiffany Grant were here as well. We were all three appearing uh, in Melbourne and, and Brizzy, uh, Gold Coast. And uh, so next year, if everything, you know, quite calms down and everything and people are flying again, they'll probably resume that. They'll probably come back over and we'll do, you know, some more here. But uh, like on our panels, we, we've been in panels for decades, you know, a couple decades now, uh, doing, you know, telling people about all of our, you know, remembrances, et cetera. So uh, some of the people may not understand, though, the way it worked at the beginning, because we did the first 26 episodes and we didn't know anything about Evangelion, really. Matt did, the director, he had an idea. He was like, this is special. And we're like, Okay. You know, we're like, it's a great job and we're going to do our best and, you know, big acting chops. And we were just, you know, really going crazy. And this is when ADV had one studio, you know, they went, they ended up having like 13. And um, so this is the very, very beginning. And this is also, which a lot of people don't understand is pre internet. There was no email. There was none of that. So the process to do those 26 episodes took two years because we would do an episode and then you'd have to mail the VHS tapes to Japan with the scripts and they would mail everything back with the edits on the scripts and everything. Uh, and they could, you know, they could do something, you know, via telephone, but that's how it went. So we would do a couple episodes and then a month or two later, do a couple more episodes and then a month or two later and go back, Oh, they had to go pick ups on the other one and then this and back and forth. So it was a very, very long process. And it was, a real interesting acting uh, gig for all of us because, you know, this was the most emotive 
serious uh, anime that we had done uh, at the time. And there was plenty of other ones, but they're kind of, they were kind of loopy, kind of goofy kind of stuff. And this was like, this sure. is some serious stuff. I mean, this is like, can I cuss on here? I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm, it's PG-13. Go ahead. Okay, great. That was some serious shit. And it was like, uh, you know, oh, he's on fire again. Let's do some more screaming in agony and pain. And I mean, really getting in there and screaming. And the technology wasn't quite the same then either. You could kind of stretch it, compress it. But if it was like a 30 second scream, I had to nail it at 30 seconds. If I went okay. over or under, we had to redo it. We wow. couldn't just add a second or stretch it that much. So there was a lot of screaming that didn't even make it. So it's not like, oh, he screamed once and that was it. It was good. No, no. No, there was a lot of screaming. <laughs> so, so you became a scream queen? I was a scream queen for quite a while there. And uh, I've done a lot of screaming in different games. And they're like, damn, dude, back off the mic. We've got it filtered as much as we can. Back off. Put your hand there. And now scream. They're like, okay, we can handle that. Because I'm think <laughs> I've heard it many times. Like, dude, you got some lungs. <laughs> <It's> like, <"Hey." laughs> um, so... Anyway, just to give you an idea of, of how that worked and how we were all in it together, but it wasn't like quite a family because it's still only you in the booth. So it's me and Matt, and then I leave, you know, and then somebody else comes in, it's Amanda and Matt, or Amanda and Matt and me and, you know, all that. So that's just how anime is done, and it still is to this day in L.A., uh, Dallas, Vancouver, anywhere. And uh, some of the, there was some fun stuff that didn't make it in the cuts. So I would say, gosh, there's just so many different outtakes that we had. Sure. And some of them are just ridiculous, but it really came in the, which one was the, the iconic scene with the hand um, over Oscar's body. Right. That scene, it was hysterical because I think we did it in L.A., and um, I'm there and I'm, I'm looking at the scene. I'm like, is he doing what I think he is? Wait, is, whoa. <laughs> and we're going to, this is, he's got, and we're going to, we're, we're doing this? <laughs> and then it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Okay. Roll them. <laughs> you know, and then we go. There's some outtakes of that scene where. <laughs> Shinji's like, oh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah, baby. Oh, it's just disgusting and ridiculous and stupid. Funny as hell. Um, gosh, what else? There was Shadow Boner. Um, shadow Boner? <laughs> there was a scene where Shinji's standing there, and the shadow on his pants looks like he has a big one. And it's like, yeah. it's like Shadow Boner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just silly stuff that happens. And gosh, recently, Amanda and I did a watch party for uh, a several episodes of the new Netflix stuff after okay. all the drama, you know, went on. And uh, I didn't want any of the drama. I didn't know anything about it until I found out. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm, hi, I'm here. Are, are, am I doing this or not? And they're like, um, you can audition for it. <laughs> like, You're all, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, it's been 20 five years, I guess, you know, all right, let's do it. Uh, I was like, yeah, sure. So we did it. And then, then obviously they went another way and that's totally their prerogative. Um, but, and then the cast did a, a good job and, you know, some people have big feelings one way or the other. I'm like, I don't care. It's your opinion, whatever. Uh, I wasn't there. I move on. But uh, Amanda and I did a watch party for, it was like, we'd watch two episodes uh, together with people. And so, uh, you know, we'd start at the same time. It's like, okay, you got yours ready to go. We got ours ready to go and hit play. And so we're watching and we're giving commentary the whole time talking about, you know, back in the day when we did it or uh, Amanda mostly vociferously <laughs> angry about what the new one was doing. And, you know, and, and it was funny because I had some wine and, and she had some, uh, some, uh, some weed and, and we're just, we're just chilling. We're just having a, a hangout party with people and we go, okay, hold on, stop, stop, stop. Okay, here's what's going on. Blah, 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 blah. And it was really, really fun. So it's been enjoyable. And I have to say, everybody knows Shinji more than most of my other roles. I've done hundreds, probably yeah, absolutely. three, four, five hundred. Uh, and IMDb has some of them. But 
Yeah, I mean, the, these are the ones that just people really, really know and sure. and love, and I'm and I'm grateful for every bit of it. You know, I mean, early on, if people are like, "Oh no, Spike hates Shinji," I'm like, "No, no, no, no! I hated being an effeminate little girly boy who saves the world in a biomechanical freaking robot and whines all the time." Yes, that is annoying. He also is the reluctant hero. He got in the thing and fought, which is amazing. Yeah. You know, so it's it's a, one of those love hate relationships, but people you know, hear a sound bite here or a sound bite there and they don't get the whole story. They don't know the whole story. That's social media for you. What do you do? <laughs> you got to pick up, you got to take your punch and roll with the punches. Hey. All right. Do you think that Shinji could have uh, used some of your dating advice when it came to Asuka and Ayanami? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Absolutely. How did, how did you get involved in uh, relationship and dating advice and, and, uh, come to that it's an interesting that. thing um so the story goes this way um so i was doing uh and people know uh this about me and a lot of people maybe you get your people don't uh if you follow my podcast or anything you know my story so what brought me out to la so i was it was 2005 i was married had a big house uh 4, square foot house with a dojo and a pub Awesome. Uh, I had real estate investments, had about 15 properties and I uh, was married and all that. And then uh, had a divorce and a bankruptcy. My wife had an affair with my, my best pal and uh, it was just awful, awful. Lost everything. Boom. Uh, and when I tell people, I said, I lost everything I knew and loved like that. I said, and that's true. That is not an overstatement. I moved to LA knowing four people. Fortunately, Amanda Wynn Lee was one of those four people. And uh, I had to start over from scratch and boy, tell me, I was rock bottom. And, you know, here I am 35 years old and I have to start over from scratch. And, you know, I used to have game before I was married and I'm like, I lost all of that over 13 years in a relationship. Right. And I was like, my God, I've got to build myself up from the lowest point in my life. And I've always been in personal growth, self-help and, and all of that. And it's like, okay, time to put that to the test. So after a couple of years of, as I say, going full Irish and uh, drinking quite a bit, I let my Irish and Scottish sides out. It's like, hey, let's do it, Waddy. Let's start the evening late. And um, so I, I just went ahead and said, okay, enough. So I started building myself up and I started studying everything about dating, relationships, uh, being a better human, a better person, and all of that, and applied them to my life. It was a bumpy road. So, I mean, some of my early con appearances, people are like, man, he was an ass. I'm like, yeah, I probably was. Was probably drinking a little. And, uh, you know, and I just, I got better and better at it. And at one convention, I started seeing like, whoa, these things aren't just for partying. You know, I can actually do something. And so I developed the, uh, you know, how to be a freaking genius voice actor, step one book. So I was doing panels on, hey, well, here's voice acting. If you're interested in that, here's a panel. Uh, and then I got um, what happens at the con stays at the con because people kept telling me these crazy stories of things that happened. And I'm a writer. I was like, well, let's make them into stories and make it a book. Why not? And I was able to sell that at conventions. And now it's on Amazon because uh, I did volume two, which it's, it's awesome. Oh, yeah. uh, well, I <laughs> yeah, you know it. You know what I'm talking about. So, um, and then um, I started seeing these panel, other panels, and it was like how to talk to girls, how to date. You know, and I was, so I went and I was listening to them. And I'm like, oh, God, these people have no idea. They have no clue. <laughs> so I was like, fine, I'm going to do my own and start as I'm doing my training and development, I will help. And uh, like I said, it started off pretty much was just like, hey, we're hanging out, we're drinking, we're talking. <laughs> and it developed into uh, don't kill your date and other cooking tips. Right. And uh, so I worked on that for a while and it got better and better. And it eventually became Food Game, A Man's Ultimate Recipe for Dating Success, which is the book that is on Amazon. Uh, went to number one in two categories, by the way. Nice. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a very good book and it's all personal growth, self-help. It's about becoming the best man you can be uh, in order to be the guy who attracts women. Um, and so, and it's all done with, with respect because it's not people are like going, Oh, he's, he's teaching game. He's teaching how to, you know, manipulate and all that. It's like, no, I'm teaching you how to be a better you so that you automatically attract. And, you know, I, I tell people, I say, look, I got the proof. Believe me, I married the proof. She's freaking amazing. Um, but I dated a playboy playmate, a Jedi and a Terminator. So do the math. Um, you know, and it was, and these are amazing people. I'm still friends with them to this day. So it's not about using anybody in any way, shape, or form. It's about communication and connection, which is my jam. 
and now I'm, I'm studied, I trained to be a coach in NLP, uh, bank personality. I've studied with some of the best, you know, trainers and coaches in the world. And so I am doing that for, I can do relationship communications for companies now, but I do one-on-one for people that really want to get their lives back in gear because there's so many things that we don't even know. Um, but in the end, I, it's taken me all around the world and I've been able to deliver this in front of thousands and I've had people come up to me at the end of some of my panels and go, dude, I, I, I didn't know half of that. And I'm just amazed what you were able to, to give me because that just saved our relationship. Or somebody say, that just saved my marriage. Or, hey, man, I'm just, I am, am down as low as I can possibly go and you just helped me. I was, I was about to commit suicide and I'm not going to now because I see there's hope. You know? And it's, that's what it's about for me. I tell people if there's any way I can keep them from going through what I had to go through in my divorce and all of that, then I win. And that's a, and that's a good thing. So I brought that training and teaching also into the reluctant heroes journey, the membership group, which is ongoing, uh, coaching. And it's, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been real good. I've got a lot of great reviews and I've helped a lot of people and I like that. So that's one of my passions is sharing, uh, the things that I've learned and uh, help other people to communicate and connect better. Oh, excellent. Uh, how did it- and I do it in silly voices sometimes too? <laughs> well, that's good. We would expect nothing less. Um, how did you how did you decide to focus on cooking as kind of a medium for the the coaching? Well, interesting enough, I see I love cooking. Always have. Uh, side note: I'm going to be going to culinary school here in Australia, so I can get a student visa. So I will actually be a chef in a couple of years. So that's well, cool. you should have told us about that at the new skills. That's it. That yeah, there you go. As a new well, I mean, that's that's new. I haven't done it yet, but that's that's what's coming next. Uh, probably January, February, I start. Um, and yeah, I will actually be a. I'll be a chef de partie or a, a sous chef, but I'll I'll be a chef. I'll have the moniker chef. Um, but I started the, 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 why I called it don't kill your date and other cooking tips is because that's how I dated in LA. There's no other way to do it as cheaply as, as I mean, the results are fen- phenomenal. You know, you have someone who comes to your apartment, you cook, all of the numbers are in your favor. All of it is wonderful because you're able to really connect instead of being at a big, you know, noisy restaurant where you have to yell over each other and she's going to order the lobster because she will, mister. And, you know, that's the deal. So I say, well, what if you can have somebody come over and, and make cassoulet or beef bourguignon, which is easier to make than it is to spell, then you're upping the game. And that's how I did it in L.A. because I was an actor. I had no money. For years, I was down to my last dime like two or three times. And it's like, well, something's going to happen. Um, but I still wanted to date. So for about seven years, I mean, that's how I did it. And I always had people coming over, first dates, you know, whatever. Um, and it works. So the funny thing, my I guess my, my tip here is I, people are like going, okay, so I just cook for a girl. She comes over to my place. Cool. Why do I need your book? I said, well, you have to be the kind of man for whom a woman will come to your apartment to be alone with you, secluded while you wield a sharp cutting instrument. <laughs> yeah, she can't there's feel a, There's a level you. of safety and security there, my friend. Yeah, she, just, she doesn't want to go over to the house of the gorilla with the, with the uh, sharp cutting implements. She wants to go somewhere safe, right? Exactly. And so you have to be that person. Uh, and that takes work. It took me work. It took me a lot of work and I was working on it continuously. I've got, you know, I have lots of successes. I've had lots of failures. You know, that's why I say I probably had more failures than, than, than most people, you know, because I, I put myself out there and that's the scary part. You know, people don't do things because they're afraid. It's like, well, you've got to do it and there's no way around it. So suck it up, suck it up, get it done. So it seems like most of your advice comes from the school of hard knocks. Is that accurate? Uh, originally, yeah, uh, and training. I mean, like like Neil Strauss wrote the game uh, back in the you know early two thousand, and that was like dating pickup and all that. Well, that's not about pickup, but he's also a very good relationship coach now as well. But you've got to start. You've got to be able to talk. You've got to be able to open up that conversation. So the original, you know first couple of things you say matter. And uh, it was just like, I had training, I had actually written for his blog for a little bit there. And I've written for, you know, many different uh, publications as a a dating expert. And it's, it's interesting, because you just, you have to 
have something to give rather. It's not advice. You have to have tips, techniques, training. And that's why when I got married uh, to Kimberly, she, she went in and did neurolinguistic programming and now she's a high performance coach for business and, and all that. And so I went and did that as well. I was like, Oh, now I have structure. I have something else I can add to my, my bag of tricks. And then we got certified as, as trainers in the bank personality thing is like, Oh, I can add that to my bag of tricks. And we trained with Brendan Bouchard, who is Oprah's coach. Oh, we can add some of that to our tricks and this one here, blah, blah, blah. So whenever I'm coaching somebody, they're getting, you know, a lot of the, some of the best coaching in the world because I have that and it goes through me. Uh, and I put it all together to make it relationship sales dynamics, which is my way of coaching. So I bring in the dating, I bring in the relationships, I bring in the business because I, you know, real estate for 10 years, I was flipping houses, you know, so I know how to make a deal. I know how to put things together. So all of that becomes my coach, which is mine. And then I'll, I'll resonate with some people who want to change their lives fast. And that's, that's what I do. That's awesome. I, I, I think that is so fascinating. Re relationships, probably some of the, the most fun coaching you could probably get into. I mean, it's, it's gotta be really satisfying to help people develop love and relationships in their lives. Well, what's interesting, what I do is I tell people, I help you see the matrix. I help you see when you have a, a relationship and people are like, bam, bam, bam. It's like, oh my gosh, we're all fighting all the time. I'm like, well, first of all, let's take it back. Go up and view. Why? What's going on? And I, I'll put them through a lot of uh, personality tests and different, you know, different tests and everything. And once I get just three main tests that I use to start with, um, and I can, I can draw them a chart and I go, okay, da, 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 here's yours. Here's his. And like, oh, here's why you're fighting here. Here's why you're fighting here. Here's why you're fighting here. And I can say, this is what he hears. When you say this, this is what he hears. Hey man, when you say this, this is what she hears. When you do this, this is what she's thinking. This is what she, da, 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 da. And they go, oh my gosh, I didn't ever know that. I knew, I, whoa. Now that I know that, I can start to change. And when you start to change, the relationship starts to change, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. I, I had the chance to look at your blog. Um, it seems like it, there's a lot of advice coming from the blog that's generated based on experience, but uh, it doesn't seem like you share a lot of the experience. So what is, what is some of the inspire or inspiration that drives the posts on your blog? Um, I think the inspiration really is I want people to get it that miscommunication is actually missed communication. Everyone tells you what they want and need, but they do it in their own language. So it's your job to learn to speak their language, their emotional language, it's EQ. Uh, emotional quotient, it's like, it's, it's really, it's about emotional intelligence. They call it EQ rather than IQ, because that's more important, especially in businesses today. In corporations, people are like, oh my gosh, you know, I, we aren't selling or we're not doing this or that. And it's usually it's because there's a miscommunication. And once you take that out of the way, you lose a lot of the, the fighting and the, you know, arguments and things because now instead of reacting to what somebody does, you're more like Sherlock Holmes and you go, Oh, huh, I wonder why they did that. And once you learn and understand, you go, Oh, I know why they did that. Interesting. Now I'll change my way of coming to talk to them and now they'll understand me better. It's fun. <laughs> that, that is fun. I, you know, I had, I had a couple guys come to me for dating advice. And the, and the one story that I think is so funny is I had this kid come to me and he says, my girlfriend just dumped me. What do I do? I said, well, what have you said to her? And he says, well, I've been trying to talk her out of it. And she just, she just wants to break up with me more and more. I said, well, stop doing that. Yeah, all you gotta say, all you gotta say is that's cool, baby. And just let it sit. Just let it ride. Yep. That's cool, baby. And just let it go. And he goes, what? That's it? That's it. <laughs> That's, yeah. I was like, yeah, just do that. Just text that to her. That's cool, baby. And just yep. let it marinate. And he goes, well, how long does it take? I said, honestly, if she hasn't called you back in two days, you're probably done. He's like, oh, okay. And so he sends the text. And an hour later, he calls me up. He's like, dude, she took me back. <laughs> We're back. We're back together. How did you do that? Yeah. I was like, oh man, this is insane. Yeah, I don't know. How that's, it works. That's, Maybe you that's, know a, how. that's, yeah, that, that's a teeny tiny little part of it. And it's like, suddenly it's like going, okay, yeah, but you're going to be right here again soon. <laughs> so, well, I, we don't know. Get... I don't know. They ended up married. They got two kids, though. So I think, I, I think it was good. It was hey, all right. Fun. It worked out for them. 
good deal. Good deal. Um, so, so I awesome. do also want to talk about the book that you mentioned earlier, what happens at the con stays at the con. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, it's a book. It's available on Amazon. It's like 111 pages of stories you've gathered from comic conventions. Is that right? Yep. And, uh, this may not surprise you. Couch crunchers are avid comic convention goers. Um, and we've had our fair share of, of stories. Uh, we had, so we're located in Phoenix. We had a Phoenix, uh, comic convention a couple years ago where we were presenting, um, a panel that we called superhero Tinder. And right as we were getting ready to talk about why black Panther was such a catch, somebody pulled the fire alarm and they had to evacuate the building and we got stuck outside. And I was like, it was right after, um, Jason David Frank got threatened at that same convention. He got threatened. Somebody showed up with a gun saying they were going to kill Jason David Frank. And like, we we're all standing out in the seat going, uh, are we targets? What's going on? Yeah, this isn't good. <laughs> but I was wondering if you could share with us, I, I did mention the oh my hint side that might not that might be rated R for for this one, but uh, could you share with us a story, a memorable story from one of the conventions that uh, you could share well, with our listeners? They are definitely more adulty, so it's it's. But I, I always say, well, if you've seen South Park, you've seen worse. So, um, but gosh, there's so many stories, and it's it's interesting. You said Jason David Frank because I'm like I want to call, I want to get him on my podcast. Actually, he seems to be doing a lot of personal positive growth things that I've seen from him. Uh, so if you have a contact, let's talk. Um, but there's so many different stories. I, I will say this in the book, there's one story. Uh, I think I call it a day in the life. I don't remember. I, that's one of the new ones. So I did volume one. That was, I sold that for years and I kept threatening to do volume two. I finally did that a couple of years ago and it's got three new stories, three long stories. And one of them is the day in the life. It's all me. It's everything that's in there happened to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and all these stories are, it's not just, okay, here's what happened. No, I, I had some characters and make it fun and I embellish and I, you know, do some silly stuff. So it's a lot of fun. But, uh, the, the overarching story is crazy things happen at conventions. You know, people are, it, it's a weird thing. I mean, people are just like any convention, even business conventions, people are promiscuous People are adventurous. People do stupid, stupid things that you would never think that they, they would never do in a regular, you know, setting. So you get some interesting stories out of that. And uh, I'll tell you one, a very bizarre thing happened to me. Um, so I was in uh, Omaha and there was a tornado um, where I'm hanging out. And at this time of night, I'm pretty much done. I'm already off the clock. So I, I remember, I don't remember how I did this. I had wine. Because I love drinking wine. Now back then I was drinking quite a bit, so I had a I had a bottle of wine. I think it was the big bottle, the double bottle. Um, and I had so I had a glass in my hand and I had a cigar. I was going to go out and smoke a cigar. So um, I'm I'm heading out to do that. And um, so I think I just had I had a robe on and my my snakeskin boots and my my jeans. And so I'm going out and as I'm walking out, people are going, we're all going down to the shelter. It's a, you know, tornado and la, la, la. And I'm like, at this time, I didn't care if I lived or died. It was pretty, you know, pretty right after my uh, breakup and everything. And I was like, eh, God wants to take me. He's going to take me. So I walk out, light my cigar. I sit out there for a little while. I'm smoking my cigar and people are going, I look back and like, there's nobody. I'm the only person out there. And I'm like, huh. Uh, maybe it's coming. And I hear the, you hear the sirens, you know, and I remember this because I grew up in Oklahoma. So I've stood, I've, I've known hurricanes and tornadoes uh, between Oklahoma and Houston. I've stood in the eye of a hurricane. I've had tornadoes go right down the street. So I'm standing out there. I'm like, I don't care. <sighs> Drinking my wine, just standing there under the, the overhang of the hotel in Omaha. And uh, so it's raining real hard. And then all the rain's going this way and it starts to go this way and it starts to go this way. It starts going. <laughs> and I'm standing I'm going, this is interesting. <laughs> and I'm watching and about 50 yards away, maybe I would say it might even be closer, but it was like, you know, parking lot and this row of trees. And suddenly this row of trees starts going. <laughs> and it's just. It goes right in front of me. And I'm like, 
That's what I thought. <laughs> I'm drinking my wine. And it was funny because when I was out there and uh, there were some people that came up, you know, the last couple of people came up, they said, please, Spike, you've got to get down. The tornado is coming. Uh, and I'm like, no, no, I got this. And they like, okay, and they ran down. And so I've told this story at another con like years later and two people in the front row go, I'm like, uh, yeah, you bless you. Go. They stood up and they go, that was us. We tried to get him in there. He's telling the truth. <laughs> I sat down. I was like, there you go. It's funny because the next morning, uh, Vic Mignogna came out and he's like, so I heard last night you pulled a Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> I was like, I think I did. I think I did. That's amazing. Well, that was crazy. Uh, we're just about out of time. So I want to thank you again, Mr. Spencer, for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure. To our listeners, be sure to check out Mr. Spencer's website, spikespencer.com. Uh, they can find you on social media. Uh, he's got a podcast, The Mind Scrambler Podcast. Uh, several yep. episodes available on uh, your favorite platform. About 45 now. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, just one released yesterday you mentioned. Um, yep. Uh, as also, please remember to follow Couch Crunchers on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and check out our blog and reviews on couchcrunchers.com. Until next time, keep on geeking on.